you know, here's some of my yarn. Would you like to design in it? And they can say yes or no, mm -hmm. or maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and Mary Jane Mucklestone uh, took this yarn that my friend and I, Ellen Mason, put together called The Happiest Yarn. So we collaborated. Mm -hmm. And um, she designed this hat, The Happiest Hat, from <laughs> The Happiest Yarn. And Hello everyone, welcome back to Vermont Craft Tours. I'm your host Sarah Scully and today we're here with Tammy White from Wing and a Prayer Farm. Hi Tammy, thanks Hi. for being here. Um, Tammy's actually here to pick up some of her sheepskins. You can see a few in the background. And if you're not familiar with um, what I do uh, during my day job, I did a little episode on this on the natural tannery uh, that I run and you can find that in our YouTube channel. So check that one out. Um, so Tammy, thanks again for being here. And uh, Tammy runs Wing and a Prayer Farm down in Shaftesbury, Vermont. Um, she's a Jill of all trades. She does a, a huge number of things. I can't even call her a shepherd because she's really um, so much more than that. She's a fiber farmer. Um, and she has a beautiful uh, setting down there, a lovely place with, you know, gardens and fruit trees and the whole bit. Um, I'm really hoping that we can organize um, a visit to your farm as part of at least one of our tours mm -hmm. in 2018. Um, and I think, well, Tammy has an amazing social media presence too. I should mention that. I'll link to all of her stuff. Um, and you do so much. Um, you know, you have all these animals. You have alpacas and sheep and goats and chickens and miniature donkeys. And what else am I forgetting? <laughs> Um, uh, in the, yeah, in the equine family, there are the minis and then there's, a, uh, there are horses and a pony and mm -hmm. a poultry, lots of poultry. Lots of poultry. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Yeah, so my piggy, uh, princess peppermint. She's an American guinea hog and she's sort of the troll of the dye garden. Oh, that's great. She cleans up everything. Right? Yeah, yeah. Good job. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to have a job on the farm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, you know, from the outsider perspective, I would say, I think a lot of people wonder how you do it all, but I think that's also a common question with farmers because they do a lot. You know, you have to be a mechanic and a problem solver and you have to do marketing and you have to grow the stuff and sometimes you have to do the value added stuff where you're, you know, transforming the raw product into something that people are actually buying and you have to go to farmers markets and sell your stuff. So. You know, I'm just wondering from your own perspective in the middle of it, not just how you do it all, but how do you make sense of it all or, or you know, what is it all kind of, is there a cohesive whole to it or is it more something that's grown piece by piece over the years? Um, that's a really good question. And um, I think it's something that, you know, started with a small, a small bit and then morphed mm -hmm. into what it is mm -hmm. to sustain Mm -hmm. You know, because the overall uh, point of it is to be able to sustain and hopefully profit from all of your work. Mm -hmm. And um, it's very difficult to to be able to uh, break even or profit from just one endeavor as a right. farmer. Right. So, um, you know, it started with going to the farmer's market with our yarn and not selling it because people weren't in the mood to buy yarn in mm -hmm. August and, mm -hmm. but they would buy something to eat, which in my situation turned out to be pies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so selling pies to support the yarn and now, you know, and then not planning on it, but both businesses growing mm -hmm. simultaneously mm -hmm. meant that I'm farming all day and all night. Right. But in, in the evening I'm, I'm baking all night. <laughs> right. And uh, <laughs> t so that, so that I can, keep paying the bills for the hay and the grain and the occasional vet and mm -hmm. the processing of fiber and et cetera. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and did you said that grew slowly over time? So it started, mm -hmm. I believe as a 4-H project oh, or something with your kids. Yeah. Way kind of, back. That was your, your toe we, in the water. Yeah. <laughs> we did do the 4-H thing and I ran a 4-H club, the Clover mm -hmm. Buds way back when they were little. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, the poultry landed on the scene first, and mm -hmm. then the sheep soon after. Mm -hmm. um, and then they were a tiny fiber flock for Shetlands that now I did a count, and I'm at 42 mm -hmm. sheep, mm -hmm. with, and then there are other fiber animals. 
that bring the numbers higher. And then um, the kids are gone. Mm -hmm. And instead of downsizing, I had mm -hmm. all of this knowledge as well as fencing. Right. Right. So <laughs> I needed to. I, yeah. So I grew the fiber flock and yeah. I grew the the value added um, mm -hmm. product. And mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, it did start small with the kids with a couple of sheep. Mm -hmm. And yeah. now. Oops. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's and way, so, yeah, I have more so energy this, than know? ever. Yeah. And I have more knowledge than I started with. So. Right. Yeah. And that can be really motivating, too. It's sort of like, oh, once you figured out how to do this part of it, then it's like, well, what's next? What else could I do? What's next? You know, I solved that issue. That's kind of how I got into this business, too. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, I'm not really challenged at my other job. What else could I do? Let's talk about some of your products. We have okay. a few um, examples here. So tell us about this. I'm going to hold up both of these items. All They're right. related. Yeah. Um, hold them close so our viewers so, can see. In the one hand, you have a, uh, a jar of calendula that's been dried from the dye garden. And um, I dye with the materials that I either grow or forage mm -hmm. on, on my farm. That's great. Yeah. So did you plant this or does it grow naturally? I plant um, the calendula beds. I have calendula beds and amaranth beds this year and indigo beds and woad mm -hmm. for uh, blue and sort of a magenta and yellow, the calendula. Mm -hmm. in, in this strength, it's a very light sort of lemon buttery yellow. Yeah, that's and I really beautiful. love it. And the calendula has also got great healing properties. So uh, we do other things with it. I I like to make salves and soaps and mm -hmm. essential oils and teas. Mm -hmm. But um, that's true for a lot of our dye materials. Right. You know, um, either kitchen waste. It's, you know, the onion skins are from the onions that you use in right. cooking. Right. Um, and et cetera. So uh, I love the colors from the garden. It's just really soothing. Every morning I go out and I pick the calendula. Mm -hmm. I, I don't deadhead them. I live head them mm -hmm. and collect them in a basket. And then I lay them out on screens. I could die with them right away and get a stronger color. But mm -hmm. because I don't necessarily die the day that I harvest, right. I dry them all and collect them. And so I think that represents probably, um, you know, that probably... Two weeks worth of mm -hmm. calendula flower. Yep. Um, and how much collection. yarn would that dye approximately? Well, when it's dried, it's not going to dye as much. It's probably a half a pound's worth mm -hmm. of forage, which will be um, maybe like I might dye six ounces of fiber with that. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You yep. need a lot of mm -hmm. dry material. Yep. Yeah. That's interesting. I've been playing mm -hmm. around a little bit with. Some natural dye, we have some things that just grow like weeds on our farm. So I've been picking a few things mm. and playing around with it this summer. It's been, but I'm just getting started with it and learning more about it. So mm. that's fascinating. Yeah. And you've taught um, natural dye classes uh, at your at your farm yeah. and had other people come and yeah. teach. So tell us more about those kind of workshops that you like to do. Right. So uh, along with pies and value-added products, um, Opening up the farm to agritourism has mm -hmm. been another way to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. And it's like I'm a facilitator in these events mm -hmm. when uh, I host a workshop mm -hmm. generally, which means that I get to see what's going on, all of right. the fun things. Yeah. But I don't necessarily participate. Uh, and so it's really inspiring and fun and feeds the creative part of, of mm -hmm. me as mm -hmm. a farmer. But um, sometimes I teach um workshops it's a lot mm -hmm. of work to teach on the farm because i'm farming right and and so in hosting and then teaching yeah <laughs> and like farming is first so if something happens on the farm i have to right. take off the teaching hat and be the farmer so um most people are fine with that they their expectations are adjusted when they come to the farm mm -hmm. but hosting workshops is a great way to share the farm teach about farming, mm -hmm. um, let people come and enjoy the farm without having to get too dirty. <laughs> right. They can if they want to. Right. But um, taking the teaching on the road is like a treat for me because mm -hmm. I get to share something I love, which is natural dyeing, in, uh, in a guest's venue. So right. I'm not having to worry about farming and teaching at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's a little more work when you take it on the road, though. Right. Um, so that's something I do on occasion. Mm -hmm. um, and so like a few times a year, I take it on the road. Yeah. Yeah. 
and you recently were in Boston. Mm. I yeah, Teaching. I taught at New England Farm to Fiber, mm-hmm. which is in the Boston public market, and I'm going I'm going to be teaching there again in 2018. Mm, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm teaching in New Hampshire in 2018 mm-hmm. um, at a retreat. Mm-hmm. Um, most of the time, though, when I'm on the road, it's for vending right. at festivals. Right. So, yeah. yeah, that's also a lot of work, as you know. It is. <laughs> but we um, we seem not to be able to catch a break with right. farmers. <laughs> well, you know, but, but for me, it's fun. You know, I work here alone. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's the time that I actually get to see people and talk about products and answer questions and say, and get that positive feedback too. Like, oh, I love your yarn. And is it amazing all the colors you come up with and blah, blah, blah. You know, so it's, it's really nice to get that kind of feedback from people because you don't necessarily hear that every day, not having coworkers and not having people, you know, stopping by your farm every day. Right. So I, I, I value that even though it is, you know, sometimes a big expense and a big production to get right. your, to take your farm store on the road. Yeah. Um, let's talk about some of the other people you've worked with over the years. Okay. This is a hat that Tammy brought in. Um, it's a design by Mary Jane Mucklestone. And I think I heard some of our knitters in the audience go squee because um, <laughs> she's, she's a really great designer. But this is your yarn. And so how did that, that come about? Okay, so uh, it's been fun reaching out to designers mm-hmm. and so I've always been pretty tenacious mm-hmm. and that I go ahead and ask folks um, you know here's some of my yarn would you like to design in it and they can say yes or no mm-hmm. or maybe mm-hmm. um, and Mary Jane Mucklestone uh, took this yarn that my friend and I Ellen Mason put together called the happiest yarn so we collaborated mm-hmm. and um, she designed this hat, the happiest hat from the happiest yarn. <laughs> and I was thrilled and excited. Sure it's a yeah. beautiful. I love um, the little, it's like darts or, yeah. yeah, or birds or something. It's really great. It's a beautiful pattern. And it was designed to include color work because mm-hmm. she did teach a workshop at our farm in color work. And so um, it was representative of that. And it was a pretty simple beginner's color work pattern mm-hmm. for that, too. Yeah, and so we've had a few collaborations, or the farm has had collaborations with a few designers, Mm -hmm. and um, they've been mostly very successful, but they've also been with designers who um, embrace farm yarns. Right. You know, that's important. Yeah, yeah. And what would you say are the, the unique qualities of a farm yarn? Farm yarn is generally a sturdier yarn. Yeah. And so you have to be a designer that is not afraid to feel the sheep right in their hands and 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 appreciate that right right so uh it's not been super washed right and it's not you know we do have like a lace weight yarn that we make but mm-hmm. generally i mean generally the type of sheep that i raise and the fiber animals i raise mm-hmm. want to make a, a worsted or a light worsted right you know right something, yarn. something like that for sweaters or hats or accessories um, it's, it's lovely. I mean, and this is Cormo. This is a fine, a fine wool yarn. Right. So it's, it's still nice and soft, even though it's not super wash. Um, but yeah, it's, it's lovely. Yeah. Um, tell us about the shawl you're wearing. Oh, this is a design by Kirsten Kapoor. It's called the Moody Kerchief Shawl. Mm-hmm. And this, oh, she didn't design it for our yarn, but this was, um, knitted in our taconic twist mm-hmm. and I wanted it to I wanted a, a nice finished object to show off the taconic twist and mm-hmm. I thought the taconic twist yarn has uh, mohair mm-hmm. and long wool Wensleydale and mm-hmm. Cotswold as well as a little mm-hmm. bit of fine wool in it and I also wanted to show off the natural dyeing so this is the taconic twist in natural and then yeah. this is taconic twist that was dyed in forsythia blooms uh-huh. this past spring yeah, um, it's beautiful. Thank you. And, and those then, those long wools have kind of a sheen with the mohair. Yeah. I don't know if it shows up on camera, but it's you know it's slightly shiny, so yeah. it really shows off the stitches. And not as many mills can mill your long wool. Mm-hmm. So um, once you find a nice a nice blend with your long wool, then it's something you want to stay with. So taconic right. twist is something that we will make again, and then mm-hmm. another blend I have with long wool from mm-hmm. my. Uh, my Wensleydales and Cotswolds is called Thelma and Louise. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll always make that because it was a, a beautiful, popular yarn. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and this is also Taconic Twist, which I forgot about that my sweater Your sweater, is. yeah. Yeah, and I dyed this with nettles. That's great. So, yeah. And Just the nettle, or is it with... Um, this was from the first nettle batch uh-huh. of 2017, which gave this amazing blue-green bath, yeah. like one kettle. Yeah. And then after that, it started going more gold, mm-hmm. gold-green. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had... Um, I had mordanted the fiber first with mm-hmm. rhubarb leaves, which mm-hmm. I often do, mm-hmm. and then dipped it in the nettle vat, and I got this color. And That's yeah, amazing. I'm really yeah. happy to have this like really going beautiful. forward in life. Right. I'll always remember that spring. <laughs> that batch special of- nettle batch, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing about natural dyes. I think, you know, there's, there's sort of two sides of it. You can get better at it. You can grow your knowledge, and you can come up with recipes that work pretty close most of the time but there's always these little surprises that come up and go oh well the last five times I did it it all kind of came out one shade and then this time for some reason it was more pink or it was more yellow or something yeah Yeah. so that's that's always interesting I playing around with it yeah and I think that I accept that and that's okay right right. if I had to be a more precise dyer Mm -hmm. it would be frustrating right and so who needs that frustration no Um, not me it's natural, and it yeah. shows the natural. I think that's the other thing of it that you know customers really appreciate that because it shows that it is from a natural source, so it's mm-hmm. it's not completely uniform. Mm-hmm. Um, what so we mentioned some of your workshops that you're going to be teaching uh, and other events for 2018. Um, what else uh, is kind of on the horizon? Any other big projects you're planning or yeah. anything? <laughs> Let's see. So many things all of the time. Yeah. Um, I'm not at liberty to share like some things that will be coming up soon, right. um, but I usually post on social media when something fun is released. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. do know, I think in December, there's going to be something fun I'll announce. Ooh. Um, <laughs> also, a little hint, I don't know when um, this will be aired, but if you uh, pay attention to the farm and the farm animals over the next couple of months, I'm going to be doing some promotion in 2018, which includes recall. So um, mm. everybody always jokes with me about how you should have a contest to see who can name the animals. So right. that, that means pay attention. You'll be, you'll be quizzed on yeah. this later. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so that's right. kind of fun. And I'll be teaching um, in a couple of places in New England in, in uh, early spring and spring of 2018. And I will also be having a couple of workshops in 2018 at the farm, like more mm-hmm. than a couple, but kind of a, a one in the spring that's bigger than usual, and then one in the fall. Um, and also, I'm hoping to collaborate with another friend <laughs> uh, for um, workshop offerings in the fall of 2018. Yeah, so. yeah, we're hoping to do that in early October. So pencil that section of your calendar for right now, and we'll okay. keep you posted. Um, yeah, so that's great. Well, thanks again, Tammy, for being with us. It's awesome to talk to you, learn all about all your different aspects of your business and your farm life. Um, Again, follow Tammy on the social media. We'll link that up in the show notes. And thank you all for being with us. Stay tuned for more episodes and subscribe to our channel. Thank you.